Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about adjacencies and passive interfaces. Our interior gateway routing protocols, so RIP, EIGRP, and OSPF, are configured under global configuration, and then they're either enabled or not on the router's individual interfaces. When the routing protocol is enabled on an interface, the router will look for other devices on that directly connected link, which are also running the routing protocol in order to peer with them. The router does this by sending out and listening for hello packets for that particular routing protocol. And when a matching peer is found, the routers form an adjacency with each other and exchange routing updates with each other. Modern routing protocols use multicast for the hello packets. This is more efficient than broadcast that was used by earlier protocols like RIP version 1. With multicast, it's specific to the particular routing protocol, so a device is only going to process that packet if it's interested in forming an adjacency with that routing protocol, unlike broadcast traffic that has to be processed by all hosts, so it's more efficient. Okay, an adjacency example. So here we've got router R1 in the middle and RA, RB, and RC. And on R1, we've got a loopback configured there with IP address 192.168.1.1 slash 32. The IP subnets configured on the interfaces, which are enabled for the routing protocol, will of course be included in its routing protocol updates. For example, R1 here has a routing protocol enabled on the loopback zero interface and interfaces fast ethernet zero slash zero and one slash zero, but it's not enabled on fast two slash zero. The reason we've done that is that RC belongs to a partner organization and we need connectivity to them, but we don't want to be sending internal network information to them. That would be a security issue. R1 will send out and listen for hello packets on the loopback zero interface and fast ethernet zero slash zero and one slash zero because those are the interfaces that we enabled the routing protocol on. And it will form adjacencies with any routers that are running that same routing protocol that it finds on those links. So in this case, we've also enabled the routing protocol on RA and on RB on the interfaces that are facing R1, so the routers will discover each other through the hello packets, and they will then form an adjacency and share routing updates. But R1 will not send out or listen for hello packets on fast two slash zero, because we didn't enable the routing protocol on that interface. So it will not form an adjacency with RC. It's not gonna be giving out any network information to RC. So the example here where RC is a partner, we need to have connectivity to them, but we're not going to be giving them out internal information. In that case, we could use static routes between us and them just to give very limited connectivity. An adjacency example, so same one, R1 will advertise its IP subnets to RA and RB because it formed adjacencies with them. So it will advertise the 10.0.0.0 slash 24 subnet, 10.0.1.0 and 192.168.1.1 slash 32, its loopback. But it will not advertise 10.0.2.0 slash 24 because that interface was not included in the routing protocol. When you enable a routing protocol globally and then you enable it on an interface, the router will try to form an adjacency on that interface by sending out hello packets and it will also advertise the subnet that is on that interface as well. But if an interface is not included in the routing protocol, 
then the router won't send hello packets out there and also it won't advertise the subnet configured on that link to other routers either. So in our scenario here, we're not going to be sending information to RC, but also RA and RB will not learn routes to 10.0.2.0 slash 24 because we didn't include it in the routing protocol. So what if we do actually need RA and RB to learn a route to get to 10.0.2? That's where passive interfaces come in. Passive interfaces allow you to include an IP subnet in the routing protocol without sending updates out of the interface. So here, if fast ethernet 2 slash 0 is configured as a passive interface, RA and RB will learn routes to 10.0.2.0, but internal network information will not be sent out to RC. So that's what we wanted to do in this situation. It's best practice to configure your loopback interfaces as passive interfaces, always. So this has nothing to do with giving out network information on them. This is because it's impossible to form an adjacency on a loopback interface. It's impossible for another router to be directly connected to the loopback interface because it's not a physical interface. It's just logical. So there's no way we're going to ever form an adjacency on a loopback. Making the loopback passive means that it will be advertised by the routing protocol. So we want to do that. We want other routers to learn how to get to the loopback, but we don't want to waste resources sending out and listening for hello packets when we know that there's never going to be another router connected in on that link. So it just makes things more efficient. Always make your loopbacks a passive interface. So the use cases for passive interfaces to summarize that are we use them on our loopback interfaces, and also physical interfaces where the device on the other side belongs to another organization. Or maybe it's not another organization, but the device on the other side, we don't want to send routing information out to it, but we do want our other internal devices to know about that link. Okay, so that was the theory for our passive interfaces. Let's actually configure them in the lab We'll do that in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.